Y'all turn to John 5. While y'all turn in there, anybody watching and want CDs or DVDs, just give me a text, email, call, whatever. Let me know. We'll send it to you. Um, anybody needs any tracks, let us know. Send that to you. And don't forget, we got the conference coming up October 20th through 22nd. If you want to come, just let me know. We'll get the room taken care of and all that. And um, just holler at me, email, whatever. Um, anything else we need? Radio. Oh, the radio. Okay. 8 a.m. weekday mornings, 1070 a.m. out of Pensacola. Uh, if you're not local, you can go online and type in 1070 Pensacola, and it'll come up. You can want, listen to it live. But anybody that wants them, if you can't get them and you want them, we can, uh, I can email them to you. I've got them on my computer. I make them at home. I can email you the radio shows, or we can burn them on a CD if you want, um, or if you want transcripts of them, because I actually type them out. I, I vaguely type it out and ship it to George, and George fixes it and cleans it up and all. So, but anyway, all right, um, we're going to uh, continue here with John, uh, what we were doing before, the seven miracles of John. And what we're doing tonight will be the third one. And in John chapter 5 is where we're going to pick up. But before we do that, let's review for just a second. Remember the first miracle, Jesus turned water into wine. And that showed several things. Number one, it showed that he was going to do away with the old covenant, the washing and scrubbing and all that. Yeah. I was going to say a prayer before we started. Okay. Yeah. I, yeah. Thank you, Chris. I forget. I'm glad y'all reminded me. Yeah. Let's open with a word of prayer. Okay. Heavenly Father, we are thankful today to be able to come to you and to study your word. We're thankful above all things for the sacrifice of your son. We pray that you use your word to bring about the cause, to change everything you would have happen. We know it won't return void. Let us just be willing and open and let the word correct us. Let experience correct us. Let all things work together for your good. Amen. Amen. Okay. Um, in the first one, he turned water into wine. Old covenant's done away. He's going to install the new covenant. Now, remember one thing clearly. What did the old covenant lack that meant it would never be uh, effective? Blood the blood of Jesus Christ. It didn't have the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. No amount of scrubbing and cleansing was ever going to take away sin. When he changed that water into wine, he showed that. But then also, on an individual level, when a person gets saved, that person has that idea, i got to get my sins taken care of all the time. And then that person sees that the blood took care of their sin. So even in their own vessel, something changes, doesn't it? Rather than having the idea of a cleansing I'm going to get accomplished, we see it was the blood that did it. Well, then we move to the second one, was the nobleman's son. And remember, we said that miracle really isn't about the nobleman's son, it's about the nobleman. He had a little bitty pinch of faith, and we watched his faith increase by hearing, didn't we? Mm -hmm. Now, when a person trusts Jesus Christ as their Savior, they immediately become a new creature, don't they? But are they a mature new creature? No, folks. It, I mean, we're, we're like little babies, completely dependent, don't know anything about anything. So along comes the second one, and Jesus Christ heals the nobleman's son, who's at the point of death. I mean, that's just about what a saved person is. They have just been snatched out of the fire of hell, and in the blink of an eye, been made born again. Here they are, there's a change. They literally was at death's door, weren't they? Now we move over to the third one. The third one, Jesus Christ is going to heal an impotent man. And what we're seeing here, just keep in mind, we want to look, there's all kind of ways we could look at this. We could look at it as the work of Jesus Christ, and it still works out fine. But we want to focus on what it means for us and what we're supposed to be doing today. Now, we can study all kind of things about what we think happened back then and what we think will happen over there, but we really need to be focused on what we need to do today, don't we? Okay, now, if we think about salvation... And in learning that I am the nobleman's son, I belong to the king, learning that God Almighty is my father, but the next thing a saved person's got to learn to do is walk in the Lord, isn't it? Now, in this particular order, it's basically just like a newborn baby. They have their birth. But the first thing they've got to learn is who mom and dad are, don't they? They say that they know the mom's voice from the, um, from the womb. They already know the mom's voice. But what does a newborn baby know about their father? Yeah. Nothing. They've got to come to know their father and learn that this is the father, this is dad, right? But then what's the next big milestone that baby comes up on? Walking, isn't it? Yeah. Learning to walk. Okay, let's pick up here. <clears throat> John 5, 1 says, 
After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. I don't know how, if y'all are aware of this, but there is a, a ton of debate and arguing that goes on over what feast this was. You know, this kind of thing used to interest me years back. I wanted to figure out this and figure out that, but you know what you come to find out? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Yeah. You can spend all your time investigating this and this fact and that fact and completely miss what the story's talking about. <laughs> Who cares what feast it was, right? It says, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. It says, now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool. Now that's very interesting because is is present tense when John's right, didn't it? Then was there still a sheep market in Jerusalem with a pool when John wrote? Yeah. Then when must have he wrote? He must have wrote before 70 A.D., right? Or it, that hole was still in the ground after 70 A.D. There's your two choices. But he says, there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool. Now what in the world is a market? Buy and sell. Buy and sell sheep. What in the world are they doing with a market at the temple? They sacrifices. They're selling sacrifices. Oh, y'all know how quickly man figures out how to sell religion. Mm -hmm. I mean, they built the Vatican and all by selling indulgences, didn't they? Sure. You want to have an affair? Well, give me five hundred dollars and I'll forgive you before you even do it. <laughs> that's what that's what they how they got it. Okay, but what that's not a new idea. Look, the Catholics didn't do something new. For years and centuries and thousands of years, man has capitalized on other men's fear of their God, haven't they? Mm -hmm. Now, what did the priesthood do? When Jesus Christ came, what did he call their temple? A den of thieves. He said, you've turned my father's house into a house of merchandise. Okay, the, all the Jewish men have to go back three times a year to Jerusalem, don't they? And they're going to be bringing their sacrifice with them. Let's say you live 200 miles away, 100 miles away, and you get your sheep or whatever you're going to sacrifice, you set it aside, and you say, okay, this is it, let's go, you load the family up, and you head down there. You get to Jerusalem, and what do you do with the sacrifice? Sure. You bring it up to the priest, and he's going to look at it, and if it's okay, wash it and sacrifice it in there. What if the priest looks at it and says, well, I don't really like the way that this looks or that looks. Just so happen to have one right over here. There you go. Chris has got it. Chris has got it. You're a hundred miles away from home and you have no sacrifice. And he says, like Chris said, but I just so happen to have a nice one owner sheep over here that I'll sell you at a fair price, right? And by the way, do you think it's a fair price? No. no. Have y'all, anybody, I haven't been in the movies in a long time, but what is a, a thing of popcorn cost in the movies? About six dollars, you could go buy Orville Redenbach or twenty bags for that cookie. Why can? Why is it that they can charge that amount? Because you don't have a purse big enough to sneak it in. That's right. Because you don't have There you go. You're a captive market. Okay. You are a captive market. Well, Israel was selling sacrifices. If you read the book of Malachi, you find out that the priesthood was accused of robbing God. Now, men have taken that today and spun it around and put it on the congregation and said, you're robbing God. Yeah. The very scripture that they use to rob the people is talking about them. <laughs> They're the ones robbing God. What were the priests doing? They were taken from the people. And were they giving the best to God and supporting the people and handing in the street? They were living high on the hog, weren't they? Oh, yes, okay. So y'all remember that guy? Um, okay, his name, by it, it fascinating thing is the man's last name is Dollar. I remember that. <laughs> Creflo Dollar. Yeah. Remember about a year or two ago, he told the people that God said he needed a, a jet? I remember that. You remember that? He got the jet. He got the jet, didn't he? Folks, does that, y'all see that? Yeah. I mean, that's exactly what we're talking about here. It's ridiculous, isn't it? Yeah. All right, so there's this sheep market. And it says, uh, verse 2 again, Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. That number five is going to come up in a minute. By the way, Bethesda means house of mercy. Well, if that place was anything, it was not a house of mercy, was it? Mm -hmm. right. Hey, now he says, uh, In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of uh, blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. 
Whosoever then first after the troubling of the water stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. Look, I don't understand about if this was a tradition or if this was, I don't, but that part doesn't matter. What matters is we've got a man here and the man is impotent. Now, look, impotent not like we use it today. Impotent means like not totally. Afflicted. Yeah, wick, say it. Afflicted. Afflicted, there you go. Impotent lacks power, right? This man can't walk. Now think about it. He had can't walk, and we're going to see in a minute the man hadn't walked in 38 years. All right? Now, he's laying here, and there's this pool of water, and he's coming to this temple, this religious building, and the man's coming there looking to get his problem healed, isn't he? Think about people going to religion today. They show up there looking to get a problem taken care of, don't they? For, for 38 years, people can go to buildings today, and will they ever get that problem solved at those buildings? Mm -hmm. Because most of those buildings now are selling religion. They're doing the same thing that was going on here. Now, it says that uh, this man, he, he's over here, verse 5 says, A certain man was there which had an infirmity 30 and 8 years. Now, did God just have the writers of the Bible fill in space? No. Does every word, I mean, do we need to take a look at them, right? Remember when you were in school and you had to write a book report, I would put the so-and-so walked very, 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 very long. And then remember just trying to fill in the words, right? Not, not so with the Bible. Why does it tell us this man was there 38 years? It meant something, doesn't it? Tell y'all what to do. Hold your hand there and go back to Deuteronomy 2. This is kind of the key to the. I ain't using that. I shouldn't use that word. This is a this this verse will help us understand this passage, I believe. Deuteronomy two. Deuteronomy is at the end of the uh, forty years, right? Now remember, we always say forty years of wandering, but in all reality, read the story. It wasn't exactly forty years of wandering, was it? It was 40 years from when they left Egypt until they crossed over the Jordan. Exactly 40 years, like God said it was going to be. But the first couple years wasn't just wandering, was it? God led them directly down to the Red Sea. He took them from there, took them straight down to Mount Sinai. At Mount Sinai, they sat right there. Moses went up 40 days, come back. God was dealing with them, wasn't he? You get there at the end of the first year, they get up and they have their tabernacle prepared and they go. When you get down, almost two years later, they're closing in on the promised land. And there it is. God said, go in and take it. I'll fight the battles. I'll do it. You go in. And they said, well, let's send some spies. Now, what was wrong right off the bat? Unbelief. 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 Folks, imagine now God is raining down bread from heaven. Right? He, he's got water coming out of a rock every day. The cloud is there, like a, probably some, like an atomic cloud, up, but, but there it is, right? And they don't believe that God can take care of these giants in the land? God said, you won't believe what the fruit and vegetables are like in this land. And they sent the spies in and they come back and what did they say? Just like God said, right? Now, they send those 12 spies in and the 12 spies come back and what do 10 of them do? They murmured. They murmured. Folks, murmuring is a horrible thing in the Bible. It, it's not like you and I think about it. It's not a whisper. Whisper doesn't cover murmur. Murmur is a filthy thing. He, I, my granny, I understand this murmuring thing perfectly. My granny would say, go do such and such. And I'd turn and say, and boy, she'd slap me on it. She said, if you got something to say, you say it loud enough to be heard or shut up. What, is, what was that murmuring? What is that? Revolting. Revolting. It's disrespectful. It's railing. Huh? It is. It's railing. It's not only what I was basically turning and saying. Y'all know what things say. It's crazy old lady. You know, you know what I mean? It's disrespectful. It's just imagine God supplying these people's need and they're murmuring against God. Not only that, they go further and they thank idols for the things God was offering them. Were. Now that's filthy, isn't it? That's a human being though. Now, after this, this period of time, they come out. They say, we can't take the land. We can't do it. And God tells them, this entire generation, everybody 21 and up, 
from, from 20 years old, that way you're okay. 21 and up, you're going to die. You won't get there. Watch Deuteronomy 2. Verse uh, 14. And the space in which we came from Kadesh Barnea until we were come over the brook Zared was thirty and eight years until all the generation of the men of war were wasted out from among the host as the Lord sware unto them. How long did they go after their unbelief? Thirty-eight years. They didn't go forty years. They went thirty-eight years from the point when, and this is because of their unbelief, they spent thirty-eight years out there, didn't they? Could they do a single thing out there in that wilderness? No. Were they totally at the mercy of God? Yeah. Alright, flip back over to uh, John. I want y'all to think about this character. We've got this story. For 38 years, he's had this infirmity, right? Now, this man is going to picture Israel under the law. That first generation said, we can do it. And what happened to them? They couldn't. They, couldn't. they couldn't. they cursed. They died, didn't they? Mm -hmm. Every one of us that was never born under the covenant of Moses' law was still born under a system somewhere of performance, trying to do good. And mm -hmm. isn't that right? But this man has been, for 38 years, he's been crippled. And I'm going to put up here like it said, impotent. He had no power. And what was he doing to try and get that rectified? He's going to the temple. And guess what the temple was? Even more impotent than him. Was anybody at that temple ever going to help this man? No. Take his money. Take his money. They're going to rob him is what they're going to do. And will it ever address the problem? No. What does that sound like to you? 38 years attempting to get a problem solved through religion and it never will work. The law. It sounds like the law of Moses, doesn't it? Religious, the law of Moses. This man represents Israel under the law. But it's going to go even further than that because me and you can see ourselves in this also. Can't you see a lifetime of trying to satisfy God through your own works? And what did you find out? You failed. You're impotent to work righteousness. And again, it's not that you and I never do anything good. It's that you and I have never worked perfect righteousness. And we never will. Mm -hmm. And what's required? Perfect, perfect righteousness. righteousness. And it's not horseshoes where if you get close, you get some points. Yeah. No, it's perfect righteousness. Now, for 38 years, this man has come to this house. And for 38 years, watch how his religious, the, the man in the pew next to him has treated him. Watch. Verse 5 again. A certain man was there which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. When Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he said unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? You know, good and well, Jesus knew the man wanted to be made whole, didn't he? Mm -hmm. But he asked him a question. Wilt thou be made whole? You know what I could call that question? You want to be saved? You want to be saved. I could call that the gospel, couldn't I? Amen. Folks, Jesus Christ just said to the man, do you want to be made whole? But what must the man, before he can be saved, what must he know? He's lost. Yeah, he can't, he's lost. He can't do it himself. Watch this man's answer. The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man. You know what that was like he's saying? I'm unable. Yeah, I want to be healed, but I'm unable. I mean, I remember coming to a point in my life when I said to the Lord, Lord, I am in trouble. I can't do it. And he says, this man, the impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. But while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. There's religion. That's a perfect picture of religion. This man could not get into the water to get cleansed because his, the guy in the pew next to him jumped in front of him, didn't he? Mm -hmm. Now, does, look, when I say religion, I don't mean everybody in every church. I'll make sure I'm not saying that, okay? But what I'm saying is, in a religious uh, setting where works are taught, does each person want to outperform the person next to him? Sure, yeah. This is jockey, and this guy's trying to crawl down in the water, and the man behind him walks all over the top of him to get down in there, right? Now watch what Jesus says, verse 8. 
Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. That simple? Yes, he said it. simple. Folks, when the gospel's preached, and the Lord basically has someone preach the gospel to you, and that truth is presented to you, it's as if the Lord is saying to you, Wilt thou be made whole? All you've got to do is believe. And if you will believe, what happens? Rise up and walk. Now it says next, immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. <laughs> so the Lord makes the man walk, but it's on the Sabbath day. Yeah. What are the Jews going to say? Breaking the Sabbath. How dare you, right? <laughs> It was just love. Alright, for 38 years now, this man came to this place. Let me just write the Jews' religion on there. Could the Jews' religion ever help that man? No. no. So what did that man have to come to the point of realizing? This, this is useless. I can't do it. This is a waste of time coming to this group of people. I'm not saying that the Lord had that had a temple built that something was wrong. I'm not saying. I'm saying that that system, the Jews' religion, was not designed to help this man. The Jews' religion was designed to keep this man in that exact state. Now, this is what's going on today. Folks, poverty is actually... All right, who do y'all think sends TV preachers the most money to? The wealthy? No. Old folks living on fixed yeah. income. Yeah. They're they're preying on them, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Alright? That's this this group here is preying on this man, and for thirty-eight years this man cannot help himself. And the Lord said, Wilt thou be made whole? And the man said, I can't do it. And what did the Lord do? Made him whole. Mm -hmm. Anybody ever seen Benny Hinn get somebody mm -hmm. to jump up? This man didn't need physical therapy, did he? Mm -hmm. He didn't have to take steroids and amino acids. Did anything need to be done other than the Word of God? The Word of God. God said when His Word went forth, it would not return void. Was there any chance that the Lord Jesus Christ was going to speak those words and that man was not going to get up? No. Yeah. no. He jumped up, threw his bed on his shoulder, and got high stepping, didn't he? Um, I was at a nursing home once, and they had a uh, uh, they had a man come in there, and the man had on. I could tell he was a uh, he was a religious uh, a religious character of some sort. But he come down there, and they were back in the physical therapy room. And I had a friend that worked there, and they had a little old lady was there, and she was in a wheelchair. And the man was back there, and he was talking real loud, so everybody could watch, getting an audience. And he was talking about that he was going to get this lady out of that chair. I was standing over to the side watching. And all he kept talking about was that he had the power. He was going to do it. Never said a word about Jesus Christ. He went on with this story about what he was going to do. And they got a therapist on each side of her. And this guy started making noises and just everything, a big show. And finally, with one of those therapists on each elbow, this little lady stood up. Her knees were knocking like that. She stood up like that, and everybody in there busting and hollering and cheering and clapping, and she sat right back down exhausted. You know what those people said? It's a miracle. <laughs> now, I'm not telling you that if God wanted that lady to walk, God couldn't make her walk. Of course not. Would God need that charlatan to do it? No. Folks, if God wanted the lady to walk, God could make her walk. But what was this man doing? He's putting on a show. He's, making on a show. Money. He's putting on a show. Getting a bunch of glory. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If that had been a work of God, would she have sat back down? No. That lady didn't jump up and throw her wheelchair on her shoulder and go run. And that lady collapsed back in the chair and then she died in that chair. Now, folks, that ain't a miracle. Mm -hmm. A miracle is the power of Almighty God. God spoke and it happened. God spoke to this man and bingo, he was made whole. It literally is a miracle every time a sinner is saved. I didn't say it's a sign or a wonder. I said it's a powerful act. A miracle is a supernatural act of God. When you've got a sinner that will admit their sins, which we don't like doing, and that person will trust by faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. Who's doing that work? God, God Almighty's doing it. That's a supernatural act. It, this man here could not do anything to help himself for 38 years.
Could Israel do a single thing out there in the wilderness about their condition? Mm -hmm. Folks, they wandered around out there. They were totally at the mercy of God, weren't they? All right, back to the man here. Verse 9 again. Immediately the man was made whole, took up his bed and walked, and on the same day was the Sabbath. The Jews therefore said unto him that was cured, It is the Sabbath day. It is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. You know, I, I mean, that's, we, 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 that's so silly when we read that, isn't it? But y'all know me and you get caught up in the same type of silliness in different ways. Yeah. I once uh, had a, a... We were at a class one time and they were talking about someone had got their head cut off on TV that day. Y'all have seen that in the last oh, yeah. couple of years. And they said, man, that was brutal. It was just, I didn't see it, but they said it was horrible. Man got his head cut off because he said he believed Jesus Christ. And another person said, that's so sad. And somebody in the room said, what's really sad is he did that and it didn't do him a lick of good. He's still going straight to hell. <laughs> and I thought, what made him say that? And you know what their reason was? He don't know the mystery. That's what they said. He, that man didn't know the mystery. In other words, he's not part of our group, so he must be wrong, right? Mm -hmm. Folks, the man got his head cut off because he denied he wouldn't deny Jesus Christ. Okay? This type of thinking here, this Pharisees, no matter how powerful the act was, or no matter how uh, no matter what a statement it was about faith, the Pharisees said, but that goes against our traditions. That goes against our religion, don't they? Now watch what they want to do. Verse 11. He answered them, He that made me whole, the same said to me, Take up thy bed and walk. Then asked they him, What man is that which said unto thee, Take up thy bed and walk? He that was healed, wist not who it was. For Jesus had conveyed himself away, a multitude being in that place. All they want to know is who did it. The first thing that a Jew that believed the scriptures should have asked whenever this man that they knew had been this way for 38 years was made whole, they should have said, where is the Messiah? Only the Messiah can do this, right? Yeah, right. Hallelujah, the Messiah has come. Yeah. What did they say? Yeah. This is against our doctrine. Yeah. This ain't according to our tradition, right? Mm -hmm. Now watch Jesus finds this man, verse 14. Afterwards, Jesus findeth him in the temple. Now, you know, that's only natural for the man to want to return there and thank God. Mm -hmm. And he should. He, want, he needs to give God the glory and the praise. But in that building, what did Jesus call that building? The men, the men of thieves. thieves. Now, watch this closely. Afterwards, Jesus findeth him in the temple and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole. Sin no more, lest the worst thing come unto thee. Now, should the man uh, try and not sin? Well, yeah, and he's trying to watch his behavior for sure, doesn't he? But Jesus didn't say here that you were made crippled because of some sin, and now beware, if you do it again, you're going to get it. That ain't what he said. It, let's see if the man understood, okay? Let's read it again, 14 and 15. Afterward, Jesus findeth him in the temple, said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole. Sin no more, lest the worst thing come unto thee. The man departed. Why didn't the man stay around and worship Jesus and try not in sin? He's in the folks. What did Jesus Christ just tell him? You're in the den of thieves. What do you do? Wait a minute. Folks, this thing right here was rotten. Jesus Christ is basically saying to the man, What are you doing back in here? I made you whole. And you're going to come get back into this idolatrous thing? Sin no more. Folks, those people that get a hold of that man and something worse will happen. Mm -hmm. Now, I tell you what worse would happen to him if the man hung around there. Guess what those Pharisees would do he'd to him? Poor. Yeah, he'd, he'd become just like him. They're going to they rob him blind, but worse yet. Did a greater miracle happen to Lazarus? Pretty great, wasn't it? Yeah. What they want to do to him? Yeah. They'll kill him. Folks, if that man would have hung around there with that ten of people said, Hey, this is the one Jesus raised. What do y'all think the Jews would have done? They'd snuff him out, won't they? So now we've got a man. 38 years he has labored trying to get this system to heal his problem, just like Israel out there in the wilderness. For 38 years, that entire generation toiled away under the law. Did anybody ever get made righteous by it? No, not a single one. Flip over to Romans 3.
at, uh, at class today, y'all heard me talk about Miss Carter, but at class today, a, a guy come in with his family, new new guy come in, and they were talking, and he said in the middle, we said something, he said, nobody's able to do that, we'll keep the law. And before I could even answer him and say, you're right, nobody could, Miss Carter stepped in for me, and she, she had the right answer. I would have answered him wrong. She said, you're wrong. Jesus Christ got the law. Oh, <laughs> what she got. Right? Now in <laughs> Romans 3.19. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law. That every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. For 38 years in the wilderness, what was Israel supposed to learn? We, we can't do it. We have got to have God. Did they ever, for the most part, admit that? No. A remnant did, but Israel wouldn't, would they? This man here is never going to be made whole at this particular building. It'll never happen. Now, I can come to a different building over here today. And I can go in a different place over here. And for 38 years, I can go to this place. And for 38 years, I can give this place my money. And I can do everything. I'll just put man's religion. <clears throat> there's something that's happening in this building that's the same thing that was wrong with this group. Exactly. What did Moses' law lack? Blood, right. Blood of, of Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. What did these places, a lot of them, not preach? The Blood of Christ. Jesus Christ. You could go to that building and all day long they could tell you how to be healthy, wealthy, and prosperous. Mm -hmm. But if they don't tell you about the Lord Jesus Christ who died as your sacrifice... They're no better than this over here. In fact, you're worse off. Look, back here, at least Israel had an excuse that the Messiah had not died for them yet. Me and you've got the whole written history, don't we? Folks, for me and you to look at the cross of Jesus Christ and to prefer our works or our own method of salvation is just about the most ridiculous thing that has ever occurred in the history of the world. Imagine a man, for instance, a Jew. For 38 years, this man could not be healed in this system, right? Mm -hmm. Jesus Christ heals him, and what do the people in this system say? <coughs> you did, you're, you're breaking our rules. Yeah. I mean, y'all think about how crazy that is. Mm -hmm. The man is a walking, talking monument to the fact that this is a bunch of baloney, isn't he? Mm -hmm. And then they say, well, oh, we got this in here. What Y'all you know, know how they do. All right, so now this same man who gets healed, turns around and goes back in here, and Jesus Christ tells him, get out of here. Go, go, get out of here, right? Come over here. Today, a man over here hears about the Lord Jesus Christ. After years of toiling, this man finally comes to, to let's just say this man's been 38 years, uh, uh, whatever you want to, whatever denomination you want to call him, Right? For 38 years, this man has been taught works for salvation, right? Has this man ever been able to walk in the Lord? It's impossible, isn't it? See, this man's going to have to come to a realization. What's he going to have to realize about himself? He's lost. He's impotent. Let me show you all his impotence. Turn over to Romans 5. Romans 5, 6. For when we were yet without strength. Folks, that's impotent. Without strength. If a man is impotent as far as having children, he does not have the power to have the children, does he? Yeah. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Alright? Then if we're impotent, all men are impotent to bring about a, the necessary righteousness, aren't they? Who's the only one that's potent? Jesus Christ. He says, verse 8, God commended His love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Okay, where in the world would this building over here get a sacrifice to pay for the sins? That you can't find one, can you? If they're preaching that sin must be forgiven through works, what's it take to forgive sin? The blood of Jesus Christ. Where are they going to get that at? 
folks, if they don't get it at the cross by faith, they can't produce it, can they? Mm -hmm. See, this system right here is twice off as bad as this one. Yeah. This one back here at least had the hope that the blood of Jesus Christ lay just in the future, didn't it? But what hope does this one over here have? None, folks. There is no hope here. This place can never help this man. Now, what happened to the entire first generation in the wilderness? They died, except for how many? Two. Okay. So what this man represents back here, in, in, in a lot of ways, he represents Moses. And when I say Moses, I mean the law. You all know how the Jews called the law Moses. What Moses say, what, right? So here's Moses. 38 years, it couldn't get the job done, could it? Did Moses bring those people into the promised land? He never got close. He brought them over there, and what had to happen to Moses? He had, he had to, to die. die. He had to die. People say he, Moses didn't go to hell. No, he's at the Mount of Transfiguration with Christ. But in the type, in the pattern, how could Moses, with the law, ever lead these people to deliverance? Couldn't do it. So Moses dies. And another character takes the lead. What's his name? Joshua. How do you say Joshua in the New Testament? Jesus. What Moses could not do, Jesus did. What Moses always would fail to do, the law always will fail, Jesus Christ succeeded, didn't he? Just like we come back here and we find out that under Moses' law, those people, no matter how hard they toiled and they strived, and all, they're always going to remain crippled and impotent, weren't they? Yeah. But Jesus Christ over here, like Joshua, led the people across the promised land into what, what we're really needing, what we're looking for, and it's not a piece of land. What is the thing that Jesus Christ brought in over here? Righteousness. Righteousness. Now, ain't that what's needed? Yeah. Could you ever get righteousness through Moses? Yeah. It's impossible. Let's go, go back over to John. Alright, y'all can see then how, how our miracles are lining up. Old covenant replaced by the new. No woman's son. Now we come over to infinite. But let's go back to the individual. Let's, let's leave Moses and the law and who the man represented. And let's talk about each one of us individually. Okay? The moment we trust Jesus Christ as our Savior, something happens. Okay? God affects a change in us. And literally the change is in what, what we're thinking, what we're trusting. Mm -hmm. We quit trusting our systems of cleansing, our religion, and we trust the blood of Christ. But then we've got to be taught that we're a child of God. You don't know that right away. You might say the words, but you have no idea what it means to be a child of God. Each one of us have got to be taught about God. And the only way we can be taught about God is by God. Right? Now, how does a child learn about their father? Can a father say to a three-day-old baby, I'm your father, and the baby said, oh, okay, I got it. How does it happen? Over time. A time how? Relationship. Relationship, experience, day by day, little things, right? Will that father, if he loves that child, not a normal father, right? Will that father ever abandon that child? No. But does that child know it at first? No. So it takes a little time for that relationship, doesn't it? When a person gets saved, this is what God would have us do. He would have all men be saved and then come unto the knowledge of the truth, isn't it? Who said, I am the way, the truth, and the light? Jesus. Folks, Jesus Christ is desiring to build a relationship with each one of us. And I don't mean instant. Look, don't ever buy this foolishness that when you're saved, that's it. You're a mature person in Christ and you got it all. There is no truth to that in the Bible. Hey, are you spiritually everything you'll ever need to be in God's eyes? Yes. But we're living in this world, aren't we? And what did Paul say is the next thing God would have us do? Put on, put on the whole armor of God. And you don't put that on overnight, do you? Mm -hmm. A baby drinks milk at first, and then it takes its first step. So Jesus Christ here showing us salvation. Come to know about God your Father. And then your Father begins to teach you to walk in Him, doesn't He? Mm -hmm. Now what do we mean when we say walk in Him? Walk in Him. 
walk the way he would have us walk, right? Is that like uh, uh, immediately I thought of Run DMC, remember it? walk this way? It, it ain't like that, is it? Walk worthy. Walk worthy of the vocation wherein you have been called. Walk worthy. There are people today that will say, you ain't, that's ridiculous. You're perfect in Christ. Well, why did Paul tell us to, to put on things? To walk worthy. To, to, to A vocation is a job, isn't it? As the Lord begins to teach us to walk, just like a little child, we start to walk, don't we? Hey, I told y'all we did it again that night with Lexi's little niece. Lexi's holding her, and let's go of her, and she's all wobbly at first, right? But as soon as she stabilized herself, you know what she'd do? She was excited. Oh, she was more than excited. She... Oh, proud. Yeah, yeah, proud. What happens to new believers? Same thing. Same thing. Proud, yeah. Then what's going to have to happen to that? They got to cut Pride cometh what? Before the fall. Before the fall. Does that mean God will kick you out and let you fall from... No, no. folks, God ain't going to... But will he let you fall down? Yeah. Yeah. Will he let you stumble? And but yeah, yeah, that's what happens with a child. As we continue going with this, y'all just look at the maturity process. Salvation, learning your the nobleman, the king's property, the father's son, learning to walk, being empowered to walk. Mm -hmm. And by the way, that man didn't have to learn to walk. Jesus Christ empowered him, didn't he? Mm -hmm. Then who's going to have to empower us if we're going to walk? Jesus the Lord. Well, can we walk on our own? No. You can walk in your own way, but you can't walk in the Lord on your own. Yeah. So the Lord has to empower us. Well, how does He do that? What comes next? He feeds 5,000. What's He feed them with? Bread. The Word. Y'all think about how He fed them. We'll do this one next time, but think about how the Lord the did it. At the bread of life. The Lord could have just said, and there would have been a truckload of bread, right? Carts and carts. Is that how he did it? No. no. Little at a time, it just kept going, didn't it? A little at a time. Did it ever? Was there ever a big multiplication? Of? No. In the story, that little bit of bread just kept going, didn't it? How do you and I learn the Word of God? A little bit. A little, bit, a little bit. Now, when Jesus feeds the 5,000, he did not give them people the bread himself, did he? What did he do? He gave it to them. He gave it to the disciples and told the disciples to feed on them. Y'all see how the Word of God works? Okay. As you begin uh, learning how to walk in the Lord, you begin to get built up by His Word, don't you? If you're going to walk in the Lord and you're going to get built up, you're going to start being uh, expected to perform some things, some services, some works, aren't you? As soon as you visibly do anything that's taking a stand or even saying the name Jesus Christ, what's the world going to do? Right. Here comes the tribulation and all that junk, isn't it? Well, what's the next thing? The sea is raging on the disciples, isn't it? That look, they done come through this part. They get out here and the sea's raging and they call out, Lord, we perish. And who was right there? Jesus. The Lord. Y'all think about us. We get saved. We, what usually happens, a person gets saved and they run out and... Uh, they just run out and charge all over the place and you know how they, they do more damage than but anyway the person gets saved they start to learn about their father that they're a son of god they start being taught how to walk in the lord the lord starts building them up and then the next thing that happens as soon as they are built up to where they can do something satan's done ain't gonna have that mm -hmm. he'll send something their way isn't he? but who was right there with the disciples the Lord. the Lord. The Lord. A lady had told me once uh, a while back, she said, I would, if only the Lord would just stand here by my side. Folks, we got something better than that. Yes. He's in you. Yeah, Folks, He said to the waves, still. And what happened? Yeah. They were still. Can the Lord give you what you need to whatever the battle is, whatever yeah. takes place? Okay. Next, the blind man gets healed. That blind man can't see at first, and he sees vaguely, and then the next thing he sees clear as a day, doesn't he? Y'all remember what Paul said would happen? He said there was coming a day, and this wasn't the point where some point of mystery was revealed. He's talking about death, but he said there would come a time, Paul said, when he would know as he was known. When will you and I know as we're known? When we're with the Lord, huh? Well, what's the last one? He raises Lazarus. Y'all see the, the progression through there? Okay, let's go back and talk about this man one more time. A few minutes we got left. 
In John 5 again, we'll notice a few things. Verse 1 says, After this there was a feast of the Jews. Wasn't John a Jew? Mm -hmm. yeah. He's writing this book. Yeah. He didn't say afterwards was one of our feasts, did he? Mm. What did he say? Mm. Feast of the Jews. Mm. You know when God first gave them those feasts? Hold, hold your hand there and go back to Leviticus 23. Leviticus 23 is where they get the feast day. I want y'all to see what they're called. Verse 4. Leviticus 23, 4 says, These are the feasts of the Lord, even holy convocation, which you shall proclaim in their seasons. And he goes on, Passover, and he gives them to them. Feast of who? The Lord. The Lord. Back over to John. John 5, 1. After this, there was a feast of the Jews. What's that tell you? God wasn't in it, folks. God didn't want no part of it. God had long ago turned his back on this thing, hadn't he? How's that man ever going to get healed if God ain't in it? What did God do? About 40 years before they went off to Babylon, the Jews, do y'all remember what God's glory did as far as the temple? It left him and departed, right? Y'all yeah. remember what Jesus Christ said as he was walking out of Jerusalem for the last time that last week before they go kill him? Your house is left unto you desolate, isn't it? How in the world was that place ever going to do anything for anyone? Now look here closely. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now take that and go back to Isaiah 1. Isaiah 1, verse 2, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord hath spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. Is that exactly what happened in the wilderness? He said, The ox knoweth his owner, the ass his master's crib, but Israel doth not know, my people doth not consider. We got a bunch of cats out there, and those cats, I don't know how they know, but those cats at 5 o'clock in the morning, they're on the porch. They know 5 o'clock. And get up, I walk out there to get, or Lex, get rid of Lexi's cat every morning, or Lexi throws it out, and those cats are there, aren't they? Here, there's an old saying, I know where my where, where my bread's buttered, right? Mm -hmm. Who fed Israel every day? God. Israel was dumber than those cats that come to my porch, folks. Those cats know where they're getting fed, don't they? It's yeah. a buffet all day long. A buffet. <laughs> <laughs> but think about it. Israel worshipped idols and who was feeding them? God. Now watch here closely. A sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity. Could you find a more religious nation on the face of the earth than Israel? Mm -hmm. And what did it say they were? Laden mm -hmm. with iniquity. What is the most... Uh, according to the book of Proverbs, there's some things that God hates, isn't there? What's at the top of God's list? Pride. 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 The proud heart. Pride like I'm proud I built did uh, I made did a good job cutting the grass? No. no. What kind of pride we pride call it? Pride of self. Self-righteous self pride. There you go. A lack of a need of God, right? Mm -hmm. Now he says, A seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors. You know how they were corruptors? What did they teach everybody they come in contact with? The law. Mm -hmm. The self-righteousness law. He can do this. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They are gone away backwards. Why should you be stricken anymore? You will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick and the whole heart faint. Folks, we're fixing to read something that's going to apply to each one of us if we'll be honest. Okay? Here's a description of man. Now watch. <clears throat> From the sole of the foot, even unto the head, there is no soundness in it. Can you say that about the flesh? You better believe it. That's me and you. But wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. 
I don't suppose there's a there's a, a grosser thing you could say than a putrefying soul. They have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. When you've got a wound, you need to treat it, don't you? Did Israel ever treat their wounds under the law? No, they got worse and worse. He says, your country is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. He goes all the way down. Look at verse 9. Except the Lord of hosts had left unto us a very small remnant, we should have been as Sodom. We should have been like unto Gomorrah. What happened to Sodom and Gomorrah? They were destroyed. What was the only thing that held up the destruction that day? Lot. Lot. What did Lot's wife turn into? Pillar of salt. What is salt in the Bible? It's a preservative. Isn't it? What's the only thing that was keeping Sodom and Gomorrah from getting destroyed when those angels showed up? <clears throat> Lot was there. He was preserving them, wasn't he? What's the only thing back here that's keeping Israel from being destroyed? A very remnant. small remnant, isn't it? He says, verse 11, To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me? Everything we're fixing to read about sacrifices, I just want y'all to think about religious works, okay? To what purpose is the multitude of your bake sales? <laughs> to what purpose is the multitude of your car washes? Right? Think about these things. Saith the Lord, I am full of the burnt offerings of rams. I don't want another person to light another candle in my name. I don't want another person to do... I mean, folks, this is the same thing. Mm -hmm. He says, In the fat of fed beasts, I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of he goats. I could say, God has no pleasure in you walking the aisle with your chest stuck out. Mm -hmm. God has no pleasure in you taking the glory for the work of Jesus Christ. He says, When you come to appear before me, who hath required this at your hand to tread my courts? Bring no more vain oblations... Incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons and Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with it is iniquity. Even the solemn meeting, the day of atonement, he said, was iniquity. Folks, how did this become, how did the Lord's feast become the feast of the Jews? What were they designed to do? Show whose glory? They were supposed to show the glory of God, right? And what did Israel use them for? their own glory. Yeah. Now y'all think about religion because that's exactly what it does. It teaches man to glorify in his works. He says, uh, verse uh, 15, When you spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Oh God, that ain't a good thing, is it? Come down to verse 25. I will turn my hand upon thee and purely purge away thy dross and take away all thy tin and I will restore thy judges as at the first and thy counselors as at the beginning. Afterward thou shalt be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. Is God going to cleanse Israel? Is God also going to cleanse the earth? Well, what would you expect if the earth is God's property and you expect there's coming a day when he's going to cleanse it, right? What did we say the person becomes when they get saved? A nobleman, a nobleman's son. You, nobleman literally means the Greek word belonging to the king. You become a son of the king, don't you? Mm -hmm. Are you now the king's property? Mm -hmm. Would you not expect the king to start cleansing his property? Wouldn't you expect him to start dealing with it? When you buy something, oh, I don't, look, you buy something today, I don't care what, go buy a used car, and what's the first thing you do? Clean it up. You go clean it all up and make it yours, don't you? Mm -hmm. Are there some changes you immediately want to make? Yeah. Yeah. There are, aren't there? Yeah. So then you, whatever me and you do, we go to the, uh, anybody like to go garage sale? Mm -hmm. I, like, I like that kind of thing. I like to look around at other people's junk, right? <laughs> One guy's getting rid of it because it's junk. But somebody in a garage sale sees something else in it, don't they? Treasure. Treasure. All right? There's a, a famous saying, and I really like it. Uh, old preacher says all the time that God is the greatest junk dealer in the history of the world. Now, you think about that. Is that what God is? God is the greatest dealer in secondhand goods that ever existed. Because what's God dealing with? Sinners, people, right? Now, when I say God is a junk dealer, I mean just that. A junk dealer buys junk, right? And fixes it up. And it becomes worth something, doesn't it? If Ralph was here, Ralph would be a good example. Ralph could 
I, he's probably off his game now. But Ralph could always look at anything, and in just a couple seconds, Ralph could tell you what it was worth, what it could be worth, and what would be the most you should pay for it. <laughs> Ralph was an expert at that, right? He'd say, you'd say, well, this is a piece of junk. And Ralph would look and he'd say, no, inside of there, there's such and such, and I can do this and I can do that with it, right? Think about a sinner getting saved over here. Is this just a pile of dirt? But does God create a new work in there? Then is God not a junk dealer? Okay, this man back here at this temple, the, the society would have looked at that man and said that's the lowest of the low. He's a zero. He's contributing nothing. Y'all know the right? He's a cripple. He's just, he's of no use. But what did the Lord Jesus Christ say? Did he pick this man because the man was special? No. Why did he pick him? Because he, because he said he was lost. To, to get the glory. He picked one that had been crippled 38 years because it fit what he wanted to do. But he also picked the lowest of the low over there because who got the glory? The Lord did, okay? He, if, if we don't believe, we have to... Look, we've got to believe something about the Lord. They would flip over to Philippians. Before we close, let's read this. Philippians 6. 6. Philippians 1, 6. <laughs> oh, yeah. Y'all yeah, find that. Y'all do it. Philippians 1, 6. This is the verse I want y'all to... Uh, I want you to go home with this verse in your head tonight. Being confident... Now, what does confident mean? Certain. 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 He didn't say, I hope to be. He said, being, present tense, being confident of this very thing, right? Specifically, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Not, oh. not may. That's right. Not may. Will. He will perform it. If Look, if Ralph bought something, it was going to get sold in that pawn shop. Yeah. Folks, if God Almighty saved you, you belong to the Lord. Is the Lord not going to use you for His purpose? Yeah. Now, you can fight and rebel against that. Like a little child, you never, never want to walk in the Lord. You can want to live in your mom's basement, so to speak, spiritually. But what we're talking about here is God Almighty performing a work. Now think about a junk dealer. A junk dealer looks at a pile of junk and sees some value in it, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. Okay. Over to chapter 2. Verse 13. For it is God which worketh. Present tense. Folks, he didn't say it's God which worked in you the day you were saved. That's what a lot of people are teaching today. God did work a work in you the day you were saved. But is He done? No. It is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of His good pleasure. Who creates the will in you? Who creates the power in you? You know all me and you can do? We can either accept it or we can rebel, can't we? You know, the, the best definition I can think of, I, I heard this and I thought, man, that's it. That's it. For sin. The best definition I've ever heard for sin. Two words. I will. Anything that follows after that is sin. Y'all think about it. I will. Who cares what your will is? It's God's will, isn't it? When we say I will, who are we not submitting ourselves to? The Lord's will. Remember Jesus Christ said, Nevertheless, thy will be done, didn't he? There, there was a... Um, if Christ, well, let's do it this way. If you are saved and you believe that Christ is in you, then is there something of value in you? Yes. Don't you think the Lord would want to bring that out of you? Sure. Paul said, let work out your salvation with fear and trembling, didn't he right here? I don't remember the names are all, but there's a great story. A man was hired a long time ago to uh, uh, chisel out a statue, right? It was a statue of Abraham Lincoln is who it was going to be. And they delivered this huge block of granite. He picked out just the one he wanted. He said, okay, this is the one. They had this great artist. I mean, that's a, that's a talent, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And so this guy set that block down and he started chiseling. 
Then they had a lady that worked out there, and she was looking. I think she was a housekeeper or something. And she looked, and she watching out there and watching. And lo and behold, the man finally starts chipping on it. Now, could anybody see what he was going to do? Mm -hmm. Just a big old block of stone, yeah. didn't it? I mean, for all intents and purposes, it ain't even worth nothing. It's rock, right? But he's working, chiseling a little here and a little there. I mean, shaving off here, shaving off there. And the man keeps working, steadily progressing towards it. But y'all know the whole time, that man could see. He could see it, couldn't he? That man, from before he ever struck the first blow, could see the finished product, couldn't he? Um, I want y'all to think about God Almighty dealing with us sinners. When God saves us, before the foundation of the world, did God already see the product he was desiring? Yes. This little old lady watched this man carve this, and she finally come up one day, and she said to that man, she said, My goodness, how did he know that Abraham Lincoln was inside that rock? <laughs> <laughs> now, I, I mean, that's funny, that's but y'all yeah. really think yeah. about it. Yeah. That Abraham Lincoln was inside that rock, was he? No. It wasn't his mind. It wasn't him, but was he there? Yes. In that man's mind, he was there. But yes. if you don't think God's got a purpose for us and something for us to do each day, then yes. you, don't, you don't believe in the power of God. Right. Don't ever believe that Satan is God's equal and that they're in a battle of equals. Right. They are not. Yes. God Almighty created Satan, and anything, anything Satan's doing today is working towards God's will. Okay. Whatever God wants to chisel or carve off, let it be carved, let it be chiseled. Just know that God knows what's inside of there. God sees the finished product. If that man knew, and he's the only one that knew, this was going to be Abraham Lincoln's nose. He knew just how to cut it, didn't he? How could I walk up there not even knowing what he's carving and saying, well, you need to take off more here or less there? <laughs> I couldn't, could I? No. Me and you want to tell God, no, not this God, or don't do that God. Folks, let the Lord do His work. Yeah. Just let it. Okay. Thank you all very much. Thank you.